the Schmidt House History Talks. Uh, I'm Carla Wolfsburg. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. This is Paul Knight, who many of you know, many of you are related to. He's got some family members in the audience. Um, and Paul was the brewmaster for the Olympia Brewing Company for many, many years and has done a thorough study of the old brick brew house, the 1906 brick brew house down below the falls that was owned by the Olympia Brewing Company. And you're going to learn a lot about how that machine worked and how beer was made in that beautiful building. So let's give Paul a nice welcome. You're welcome. Uh, see a lot of friends and uh, former co workers and uh, family in the audience. Happy you're all here today. I got one thing, sorry. It's the sound. Is it on? Okay, my name is uh, Paul Knight, and as Carla mentioned, I worked for the Olympia Brewing Company for many years, actually 1961 through uh, uh, until 1997 when I retired. And uh, during that time, uh, I was uh, not the only brewmaster, but I was the, the manager of the brewing department, which gave me the, the title of brewmaster. Uh, actually, there were several brewmasters in the group, and uh, some of them were Schmitz, and, and some were um, people like myself. I won't name all of them uh, because of time. I, I went to brewing school in 1972 and uh, came back and was promoted to assistant brewmaster in uh, 1973. And then uh, in 1974, I got the job as uh, brewmaster or manager of the brewing department. And uh, that's where I, I stayed until I retired in 1997. It's the best place in the brewery, by the way. Uh, we're going to be talking about making beer in the tall brick brew house, the one down by the lake that everybody's so familiar with. Uh, Leopold actually built <coughs> two breweries down there. Fir first one he built was a um, uh, wood frame uh, brewery, brew house, and uh, that was in 1896. He uh, began construction on it in uh, uh, January 1st of 1896, and by August 31st he made the first brew, and that brew went to market in uh, October of the same year. A phenomenal of di feat for that time period. Can you imagine the logistics of getting a, a brewery together and up and running in uh, nine months without uh, emails and uh, cell phones and so forth. Okay, I worked in uh, this brewery. I wasn't old enough and actually wasn't around to work in the original one, but um, this is a, what we call the modern brewery. And uh, there are quite a few uh, similarities and uh, a lot of differences between what Leopold built down by the lake and uh, what you see on the screen. The, uh, this brewery is different from a different time period. Uh, everything had changed between uh, 1896 and uh, 1934, when, when this one uh, started in, in this location. It was uh, built in uh, 1933 and started uh, production after Prohibition was repealed in 1933. Uh, it started uh, much smaller than you see it on the screen, but it, it still was a, a nice uh, worry for the time, and, and it was very successful and, and grew. The um, different view of it. Uh, one, one of the big differences between uh, this brewery and uh, the breweries down below, especially the uh, 1906 brewery, was the 1906 brewery made uh, extensive use of uh, gravity. It was a, a tall building, and they used uh, utilized gravity to its best advantage. To because one thing because of energy cost and uh, energy availability and energy reliability, whereas uh, with this brewery, uh, 
was quite different. Uh, the energy was much more available, uh, cheaper, relatively speaking, and um, uh, more reliable. Plus, uh, control equipment, uh, auto automation and uh, electronic controls, uh, pneumatic controls had advanced a long way. So, totally different um, concept in the way it was built. This brewery had more th of the brewing operation uh, on the uh, uh, two floors, whereas the older brewery uh, was spread out over uh, several floors to utilize energy more. This is a shot of the uh, lotter tub in the uh, 1968 brewery. At the time this was installed, it was the largest one in the world. And uh, it was uh, leading in the technology of the day. Uh, the uh, uh, similarities of the uh, old breweries and the new breweries was that uh, the process essentially was the same. It, it looked different. Uh, things were located different places, but the basic process was the same. Uh, the materials essentially were the same. Uh, they used uh, the malted barley, the uh, rice, and uh, hops. And the methods were very similar. Uh, the, even the water was similar. The old Bori used uh, spring water. The uh, new Bori used uh, water from the same aquifer, aquifer, but they had to drill wells to get it. But uh, essentially it's the same brewing water. And another constant was the uh, Schmidt family had control of the company from its inception until it was sold in uh, 1983. The major players, there were a lot of Schmidts involved in the operation of the company over the years, but the uh, major players were, uh, of course, Leopold, the founder, Peter G., uh, his son. Uh, Peter G. was a brewmaster in the, the old red brick brew house. And then uh, after Prohibition, he organized the uh, uh, building of this uh, modern brewery. And uh, after Peter G. went out of office, uh, I think he passed away, uh, Adolph Jr. took over. And then uh, after Adolph Jr., we had Robert A. A little uh, history about uh, Leopold. This shows him at the approximate age in which he uh, came to this era. He had, he was born in uh, Germany in uh, 1846. And at age 14, he started studying uh, merchant marine sailing. He went to sea at a uh, very young age. And uh, at one point, he came to New York on a s large uh, sailing ship. And while it was being unloaded and reloaded with uh, cargo for world trade, he decided to stay in the United States. Uh, being a sailor, he found jobs sailing on the Great Lakes. And he did that for a few years. And uh, in the meantime, he started studying uh, carpentry and then practicing carpentry. He became a journeyman carpenter. And he worked his way to uh, uh, Montana and formed a construction company. Uh, while doing that, he became friends with a, a fellow that owned a brewery, and uh, Leopold's friend had to, because of health reasons, had to be away. He had to go back to Europe for treatment, and uh, he asked Leopold to manage the brewery for him while he was gone. Well, that got uh, Leopold into the brewing business. And at uh, age uh, I believe it was 32, he went to 
Burg School uh, in uh, Germany. He went to the uh, Worms Brewing Academy. And uh, there he learned uh, much about brewing, of course, but one of the basic things he learned that stuck with him all, all over the years was how important uh, pure yeast culture was to the brewing operation. Up to that point, uh, brewers didn't know much about yeast. This, we're talking uh, um, a period of like 1860, 1870, and Louis Pasteur had done a lot of work on developing, developing yeast cultures, and uh, they were teaching this at that uh, brewing school in Germany, and it very much impressed uh, young Leopold Schmidt. Anyway, he uh, got into politics as well as uh, brewing and uh, brewing management. And on a trip to Olympia on uh, Montana State Business, he uh, was in a local barber shop and uh, was talking about uh, water and brewing and the barber told him about a property out in Tumwater below the falls that had some spectacular spring, springs running out of the ground. So uh, he went out and took a look. And uh, this is the property in which uh, the barber had described. And uh, Leopold examined the water, uh, tasted it, smelled it. He was very impressed with it. So he uh, 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 ended up buying the property and uh, he moved his family out here. And the, the, the family is pictured here. We have a top back row uh, on the left. We, we have um, Frank and then Peter G is the tall one, more or less in the center. Uh, we have Leopold. Uh, Adolf, and in the front row left we have uh, Frederick, there's uh, Leopold, uh, Philippine, their only daughter, and uh, Johanna, the, the mom. He was so intent on uh, building a, a brewery that uh, he was proceeding, but he decided he'd better get some uh, further uh, verification of the quality of the water. So he, he sent uh, some samples back to Chicago to a testing laboratory and asked for their opinion on it. And uh, the letter reads, uh, if you can't, in case you can't see it, it's from uh, Olympia, Washington. This is uh, November 9th, 1895. From Olympia, Washington, I have forwarded to you by express two demijohns filled with water for analysis as to the adaptation for brewing properties. Please send me the report on it as soon as possible with half, with a bill of charges and oblige. Respectfully, uh, Leopold Schmidt. He didn't even have to get a purchase order to do that. He. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Leo Le Leopold uh, had already bought the property, moved his family out here, and uh, he started building the brewery. It's 1896. This was the wood frame one. And this is, this is uh, where he built it. You can see the uh, falls over to the right. You can see the hillside in the background. And that's where we are at the moment. And this was the Carlton by Carter and Bowles Tannery. Uh, it had been in operation there for several years, but that happened to be where the spring water was. So he made him a generous offer of $4,500 in gold coins. and. Um, ended up with the property. Uh, this is the brewery that he built on the property in nine months, mind you.
The first beer went to market October 1st, 1896. Here's some uh, interior shots of the uh, brew house. Uh, I'm sorry about the poor quality of the picture, but uh, here you can see the kettle. That was a 50 barrel kettle. And uh, it was adequate for its day and time and, and for the market he had. Uh, 50 barrels in, back then was a reasonably large brewery. Uh, but up above, you can see the uh, combination mash lauder tub. All the, uh, the grains were mixed with water and uh, the uh, extract was taken off. It flowed down through a grant that we can't see because of the uh, light dust pre-lighting. Anyway, it ended up in the kettle where they boiled it and added hops and then on to uh, fermentation. Here's some of the advertising for the day. And here's the crew that ran the brewery. Uh, you can see the evidently we're doing some kind of a celebration, marking some event. It's hard to tell, but the, the uh, picture was taken in, uh, I believe, March of uh, 1903. But they were still brewing in that uh, uh, wood frame brew house. Here's the, uh, a brewing chart of how w well business was doing. Uh, Leopold's beer was better than anybody else's at the time, and it really took off as far as popularity. You can see the first full year of uh, production uh, in the after the first full year would have been 19 1897, produced 4,255 barrels. Well, they doubled that the very next year. And then the, the next year, a big increase. Next year, double again, more than. Uh, 1901 was a, a good increase. Go down through the years, you can see tremendous increases. By 1905, they were producing 60,000 barrels. This was out of that small 50 barrel brewery. <laughs> it was running around the clock. And they had uh, made provisions with equipment downstream, well, upstream and downstream from the uh, cattle, uh, so that they were able to uh, put the cattle on a four-day, four-brew-per-day uh, operation. And to make uh, 60,000 barrels, they had to run at least 300 days of the year to make that much. That was time out for holidays and clean up and you name it, weather. But anyway, uh, it just shows the popularity of the brew, uh, the, the beer that uh, Leopold was making. And uh, probably, uh, probably about 1902 or three, Leopold started thinking, hey, I gotta have a new brewery. So in uh, 1904, he called in um, the Vilter Manufacturing Company from Chicago and asked them to design a, a new brew house for him. I'm sure he had a, a lot of input on that. But uh, anyway, he uh, uh, they started building that new brewery on, uh, in uh, 1905, and it was com completed in 1906. It was a much larger brewery. The kettle in uh, the new brewery, the tall brick brew house, was 350 barrels compared to the 50 barrel one he's in the uh, wood frame one. And it was p putting out uh, two brews per day. But just to give you a little perspective, uh, a 350 barrel brew will fill 116,000 bottles, uh, fill almost uh, 20,000 six packs. So they were in uh, high production at the time. The, the new brewery, the tall brick one, was 101 feet tall and uh, designed to utilize uh, 
uh, gravity as much as possible. And uh, the brewery was certainly revolutionary in design concept for its time and a first rate construction with fine detailing. It was very beautiful while being practical. Uh, you know, gravity is not entirely free because first you have to get there. And, uh, but it saves much energy uh, when uh, using the proper layout for the equipment. Uh, gravity, by the way, is what keeps our feet on the ground. It's also what makes uh, the needle read a little high on, on the bathroom scale when you step on it. <laughs> the uh, core building crew that built the new brewery uh, was pictured here. These, these guys in the back probably were the engineers, but uh, also in the group would, would have been uh, steel workers, masons, pipe fitters, carpenters all experts in their trade who supervise the construction of the uh, uh, new brewery. And uh, this is what they built. This is a, an architectural drawing of the, the brewery that they built. Uh, and you may have seen the, uh, it, the drawing on a stand out in the lobby. But it uh, contained all the uh, de depiction of the equipment uh, as it was located in the brewery. And uh, so they built this new brewery and uh, new brew house. So that made other areas of the installation inadequate. So they had to expand other parts of it as well. Uh, the, the building and the site was under continuous construction from day one. Here's what uh, they built. This is the, the new brew house. And you can see the, uh, the original one, the wood frame one back here. This is actually the brew house, and this is the uh, uh, cellar building that was built at the same time. But, uh, here you can see the very next year after this brewery was complete, they, did a major uh, expansion on uh, as far as cellar capacity uh, behind that. Here you can see the uh, railroad bridge that crossed the Deschutes River from uh, Heritage Park. Some of the equipment used in the gravity system. Now we, we don't have a lot of pictures of interior equipment uh, in the old brewery, unfortunately, but we have a few. And uh, this is uh, a picture of the third floor. And um, the, all the uh, dry material had tr uh, trickled down from the uh, top, the top floors. And, into this area. This is the first uh, place where uh, dry, m dry grain meets uh, water and it's mixed up and made into mash. Uh, the, um, the, the, lo the location of that equipment is this uh, vessel right here. The, on the second floor, we have uh, the mash cooker here. This is where the, the rice is cooked, boiled. And uh, then over to the left, we have the kettle where it eventually uh, gets boiled. Uh, over here on the left, you can just see the corner of the brewmaster's office. This is a window right here. And uh, that gave the brewmaster a, a good view of the, the brew floor. And he could keep track of what was happening as the brews went through. And uh, that, that equipment was located essentially in the uh, same area, except on the second floor. It'd be about here from the uh, lot third floor. So the uh, equipment uh, 
here took advantage of gravity flowing downward to the next floor. Here's a uh, close-up of the grant. That's, that's a vessel that's between the, uh, the mash tub and the, uh, lotter, uh, and the kettle, and it controls the rate of flow. You can see uh, a piping manifold here. That's where it regulated the flow out of the main mash. And uh, here's the, uh, the way the kettle looked. This is exactly uh, the depiction of the kettle that was there. The, uh, it was set in the floor. So this would be the second floor level here with the top of the kettle sticking up above and the bottom hanging down below. And the location of that was in this same area. On this drawing, it's not uh, really visible except for dotted lines. You might be able to see that on the uh, drawing below or out in the lobby. And uh, the next, after the uh, wort was boiled in the uh, kettle, it had to be cooled. So this is a what they call a bottle lock cooler. Series of uh, tubes, the, the uh, 212 degree wort trickles over and uh, it's cooled so it can add yeast. And the location of that is on the bottom floor. We're still using gravity. Uh, th that would be this uh, equipment here. It's in uh, cutaway view. We have a flowchart uh, here of the simplified um, um, brewing process. And this is very crude and uh, simple as a, you might uh, see. But the, the main part of the uh, malted barley is represented by this uh, symbol here. This is the uh, uh, cooker mash that is um, uh, where it's boiled. And, and these two mashes get combined into the uh, combination mash tub, lotter tub. From there, it flows through the grant into the kettle, and hops are added to the kettle, and they're boiled. Then uh, we go through the hop jack. The hop jack is a vessel with a false bottom that strains out the uh, hop residue. Uh, it's still at near boiling temperature when it reaches the cooler. It has to be cool before we can add yeast uh, in the fermenter. and. Uh, ferment the product. And then from there, from the fermenter, after a series of other steps uh, in aging tanks and so forth, we end up in bottles and kegs. Uh, some of the ingredients uh, in the making of the beer is, um, this is the malted barley. This shows, actually this is green malt that hasn't been uh, roasted yet. But, and it still has the rootlets attached. And we'll, we'll talk more about the malt later. And then uh, we have the crushed rice that's boiled. And then uh, we have the hops that are, are added in the kettle. So we come to uh, making a brew. We're actually gonna make a brew. This, and this is a real brew uh, from, from the uh, old brewing records and uh, the drawings that I've showed you of, of the uh, architectural drawings of the brewery. I was able to figure out very much what they were doing, when they were doing it, how they did it. So I selected a brew that they actually made on uh, Saturday, March 20th, 1907. And uh, the started this brew making at uh, 7 a.m. and it took 12 hours to complete it. And this is the brew house portion. This doesn't mean it's ready to package. It was brewed and, and went to fermentation in 12 hours. There were many more, there were several weeks left yet to process the brew before it could be packaged. 
So here's the crew. That, uh, this is the, the brand that the brew would be going into. It's the Olympia brand, and this was a lager uh, pale ale. Uh, when the brew went to package, it would go in, into these brands. This is a crew that you saw before, but they were still working, and uh, I picked seven guys out of this crew and uh, simulated them as, as the workers that went into the brew that we're making. You can see the, uh, actually the brewmaster, this is William Norman. He started uh, work for the, the company in uh, 1902 and uh, worked through 1908, I believe. And uh, Mr. Norman is the fellow that uh, built the Henderson House. He built that in uh, 1905, I believe it was. So he left a, a, a legacy. Besides being a, a brewmaster, he left a, a legacy. But you can see that uh, he's doing a bit of uh, quality control work while he's having his picture taken. <laughs> it's like any good, good brewmaster, he's checking the quality of the product with that mug of beer in his hand. And uh, this, this is where they made the brew. Uh, the way things flowed in the brew house was that uh, Brewing material would come in by rail. They were fortunate to have uh, the bridge across the river and they could get rail cars into that area. And uh, that contained uh, large quantities of uh, malted barley and uh, rice and uh, uh, probably hops, uh, whatever they needed to make the brew. But to, to get the material out of the rail car, it was dumped into hoppers. Uh, it, this location right here. And the uh, hopper fed uh, bucket elevators that took the material all the way to the top, all the way up to the sixth floor. The, uh, at the sixth floor level, the material was dumped into uh, chutes that uh, allowed the, the material to go either into the brew or into storage. They had uh, big grain storage tanks over here. So if, if they were making a brew while they were unloading the rail car, it could go directly in, into the brews and trickle down uh, by gravity, as we've talked about before. If uh, they had to use material that was already in storage, it had to be dropped down to the uh, bottom. and, and and re-elevated to the sixth floor. That, that's one of the things where I said gravity is not entirely free. There's times it, it doesn't work t totally for you. But uh, anyway, the uh, uh, material would float, float down in, in uh, that, that direction. And uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the size of this brew we're making, brew number 63, uh, it contained 11,900 pounds of malted barley. Uh, it contained 3,400 pounds of rice and 200 pounds of hops. Altogether, were seven and a half tons of material that, that went into brew number 63. The enzymes in the uh, kernel that are naturally occurring starts to modify the starch, which is the, uh, the food source for the new plant. The, the barley kernel carries its own food source to get it uh, independent until the roots get large enough to take nutrient in from the soil that it planted in. Of course, we're in a malt house, so it doesn't know the difference at the time, but uh, you can see uh, as it processes over a number of uh, weeks and in, into, uh, uh, excuse me, days and in, into a short number of weeks, the, uh, the uh, acrospire has grown to three quarters the length of the, the kernel. 
and you see more modification of the starch molecules and larger uh, root area. But this is where the uh, monster wants the thing to stop growing. So he withdraws the water, adds heat, and uh, ends up with a, uh, a malted barley. And you can see the acrospire grows a little bit after the water is turned off. But uh, this is an ideal uh, depiction of uh, how the uh, malted barley should look. The, uh, after that, the, the malt is uh, roasted uh, to the individual uh, specification of the, the brewery they're supplying. And uh, from, from the hard, uh, glassy kernel that we first saw, this is uh, the way it looks when it is uh, ready to, to roast and the rootlets are removed and uh, then it's shipped to the brewery. Okay, let's get back to making uh, brew number 63. In the hop room, uh, Paul Schmidt reads a hop recipe and weighs out 56 pounds of uh, Willamette Valley hops, 120 pounds of old crop and 22 pounds of Puyallup hops. This is the growing areas. And due to seasonal variations and growing conditions, it's customary to blend uh, old crop and new crop. Otherwise, uh, you could have enough difference in a, a growing season to make a change in the character of the beer. So to prevent that, uh, the uh, crops are uh, phased in to each other. Uh, on a gradual basis. Okay, back to uh, the uh, uh, brew house. Uh, I, I mentioned there's a, a main mash which contains the bulk of the brewing material, and then there's the uh, cooker mash, which contains the uh, the rice or the adjunct, if if you prefer. This is the uh, the mash cooker. This is the the main. This is the uh, main mash cooker. Those two vessels, the material in those two vessel vessels, has to be combined in order to make the brew. So it gets a little tedious at this point. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Uh, we're getting short. Uh, okay, so uh, we combine the uh, two, two uh, vessels in a very precise time and temperature sequence. And uh, this has to be, it has to be done, and it has to be done accurately, or uh, uh, things uh, do not uh, progress. Uh, in the cooker mash, they add, along with the rice, they have added uh, a fairly small amount of malted barley to take advantage of the natural enzyme, because <laughs> When, when you uh, boil the rice, it has to be boiled so you can fracture the uh, starch molecules uh, so that uh, they can be converted to fermentable sugars. Well, the uh, malted barley that they add containing uh, proteolytic en enzymes starts breaking down those uh, starch molecules and uh, allows it to uh, liquefy. First, you, in, in, in the cooker for, for the rice, you have to first gelatinize it by boiling or bringing it up to near boiling. It gets real thick and pasty. To be able to process it further, the enzymes in the malt has turned that into a liquid, back to a liquid. 
And that has to happen. That's a very important step. So we have to go from uh, gelatinization to liquefaction before we can make fermentable sugar out of the starch. So uh, Schultz turns on the steam jets to bring the uh, cooker mass to a full boil. And uh, this is the same time Fred Weber is dropping the 11,060 pounds of milled malt into the combination mash and lauder tub, this, this uh, vessel right here. Now that, they're getting ready to uh, combine the, the, the two vessels, and as I mentioned, it has to be in a very precise time and temperature period. And so they end up with, uh, when they're combined, they end up with a uh, temperature of 158 degrees. Now, I'm being specific on this because we're actually making the brew that they made in 1907. Anyway, uh, after these two were combined at a final temperature of 158 degrees, they had to let that uh, rest for a moment for, for the, all the chemical uh, and enzymatic reactions to take place. So at the end of uh, 20 minutes, which is normally sufficient for a full conversion to fermentable sugars, the brewer uh, takes a sample, puts it on a ceramic plate, and, and drops some iodine on it. If there's no reaction, if the iodine stays amber colored, everything is fine and the, the brew can progress. If uh, they get a purple color immediately from the iodine in the presence of the starch, they didn't have completion. So rather than uh, uh, the brew pro progressing normally with a negative test, when they get a positive test, they've got pig feed. <laughs> uh, Dan O'Neill can attest to that. He'll be the speaker next month, and uh, he'll probably get into this. Anyway, the uh, mass temperature is then raised to 168 degrees, and that's to stop enzymatic action because they, they have conversion. They don't want to convert all the available starch to fermentable sugars. They only want to convert uh, enough to, to make the product and the right alcohol content and body and flavor profile that they're looking for. So the brewmaster Norman has been monitoring all of this. He's checking on these guys to make sure it's done. In fact, in small operations, the brewmaster did his own mashing. It's so critical that uh, the brewmaster would do his own mashing. And the larger operation, he has to trust it to other trained people. Uh, and the laudering, we've been in the mash vessel, this combination mash lauder tub. We'll, we'll start calling that the lauder tub now because it's being converted from a mash vessel to a lauder tub by changing the, the rakes inside to, to rakes rather than paddles that they use for mixing. And we have a drive mechanism up above here that that rotates these rakes around as they're uh, drawing off the wort in, into the kettle. And uh, they have to run this, uh, these rakes at various times throughout the brew to keep the grain bed permeable so that the liquid can flow down through it. Uh, when, when the original liquid is all drawn off, they uh, start uh, what they call sparging, they sprinkle warm water over that to uh, uh, flush the uh, as much extract as they can get out, out of the grains. A very important piece in this whole uh, draw-off operation is, is the, the grant that I mentioned earlier. And uh, it, it just, it's, a, it's a small cylindrical uh, vessel 
it has a, a door in it or two where the brewer can observe uh, the, the liquid flowing through it. And they can control the flow of the liquid with these valves on the, the manifold here. There's actually 10 uh, draw-offs in that combination vessel that uh, are drawing from different spots around the circumference of the vessel and under the false bottom, drawing the liquid out, allowing it to run into the kettle. And uh, the manifold up above is the, uh, the water manifold where, where they can uh, flush the grain out. And if they have to uh, flush underneath it to uplift it and reestablish a, a proper filter bed. Okay, now the wort is in the kettle. It'll um, boil in the kettle for 90 minutes. Uh, during that time period, there'll be uh, three additions of hops. And uh, we end up with uh, 330 barrels of 200 degree, 212 degree wort containing 15% solids in, in the form of fermentable sugars. And this has to be cool to in their, th this case, brew number 63, they cooled it to 54 degrees. You can't add yeast to a, a hot liquid or you'll kill the yeast, so it has to be cooled down to uh, their specified temperature of uh, 54 degrees. And uh, so they, they drop this, uh, actually f uh, William Lorenzen, one of the crew that we so earlier, drops this uh, wort into the floor, uh, hop jack that is down under the uh, kettle. And uh, it drops it through this, the uh, hop jack. The particulate matter of the hops is left in the hop jack and the liquid uh, flows on into the uh, cooler. Now those uh, the spent grain, as well as the spent hops, are then uh, hauled away for uh, animal feed. So, here's the uh, bottle lock cooler. The liquid flows downward over it. It trickles down on the outside into this tray, and then it goes to the fermentation cellars. This, uh, the way it works, the cool water is flowing the other way cooling the uh, liquid, but it heats the water. It, the hot water is used for oncoming brews. Okay, we add yeast. Uh, these are individual yeast cells. They're magnified about 6,000 times the normal uh, size. You can see uh, where they are multiplying. The way they multiply, they, they get a little bulge like this. It separates like that. Then it, for every yeast cell you put into a brew, you get about three back. So there's a considerable amount of multiplication. This is the way a yeast slurry would look, and this is the way it's added to the beer, uh, the, or the wort to make it ferment. There's trillions of yeast cells uh, that go into it. Uh, that, the brew number 63 would take about 30 gallons of this yeast slurry. Uh, I'd hate to guess how many yeast cells there is, but uh, there's a lot. It, it, make, it would pay all the national debt, I think. <laughs> okay. We, we have uh, added the yeast. I uh, have some, uh, uh, after we've added the yeast, it goes to fermentation for uh, about 15 days. And then after fermentation, it goes into other steps of refinement and processing, uh, aging, and then it's packaged as uh, Olympia Pale Ale. So we've completed that brew. Uh, some miscellaneous views of the brewery uh, looking uh, west, Tumwater Hill. Up here, the, the water tank on top of the Tumwater Hill would be about there. The, uh, just a, a view from the lake with the Schmidt House uh, up on the hill. Uh, 
cellar expansion going on. This would have been 1907. And uh, the br brick brew house today, this is the way it looks today. It's been shut down for many years, as you know. Uh, it last brewed beer in 1916, and then it was uh, closed down because of prohibition. Fairly new building at the time. Okay, this is uh, another view inside where we, uh, uh, this is the way it looks today. This is where the, the, the grant sat. This, this right here, this, uh, it's that uh, little platform there where the guy is standing, the, the brewer is standing in front of the grant. He's actually looking at a sample he has retract, uh, extracted from the uh, grant and he's examining it for clarity. It has to be clear before you allow it to flow into the kettle. So that's what he's doing. He's checking the clarity of that brew. Here's a, a view of the uh, kettle, uh, the cooker, I'm sorry. And, and that's the only brewing vessel that's in, left in the building today. Okay, um, this is uh, the ideal picture of the old brew house. But um, the old brew house is the last reminder of the pioneer industries that were once located in the Chutes River in the Falls area. And it's a piece of original equipment still in place, as I mentioned. But uh, most of it was sold off during World War II, uh, actually one and two for scrap. We, we, today we refer to the old building as a historic landmark. It's an important icon of the Puget Sound region. And it's in the uh, Tomorrow Historic District. And uh, it's on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. In uh, 2010, the old brew house and surrounding properties were purchased by a private developer. And it's hoped that uh, some use will be made of the uh, brewery and uh, restored and made available to the public for some purpose at some time. And uh, I, I want to warn you standing, uh, sitting there, there's a sound that will come out of the uh, projector. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's a brewery whistle. Well, thank you very much. Do we have questions? This okay, to get the water to that upper floor, was it a flew uh, from the upper part of the falls? How did they no, uh, that is one place where gravity did not work for us. We had to pump it up there. And so, what was your energy source? It was the electrical energy. And uh, that was power from the, uh, the, the lower falls. But by, by this time, the second uh, powerhouse had been installed onto lower falls, so they were getting power from there. Uh, but the brewery also had its own backup power system, too, in case of. Which was what? Uh, it was uh, in the form of um, coal powered. Uh, they, they turned coal into gas and uh, uh, heated. Uh, Water meets generated power with that. Yes, sir. You mentioned three kinds of hops in the batch number yes. three. Yes. Willamette. I think I heard Puyallup. Puyallup. What was the other, the other one that I didn't hear? The one that you had the most of? Old, I think you said old hops or something like that? The old crop. Old crop. Yeah, that was last year's Side. crop uh, blending in with this year's crop. Oh, I see. One other question, was it a lager yeast or, or an ale yeast? It was a lager yeast. Lager. It was a bottom fermenting uh, <coughs> Carlsberg Genus variety. Paul, mm -hmm. well, as a former home brewer, the thing that surprised me is that Schmidt, being a German trained brewer, would use rice as an adjunct to, because they can't use that, they can't use rice in Germany. Uh, that's, that's correct. So they have the rhein uh, uh treaty in Germany that prevents the use of uh, 
So it's an economic uh, deal? Or? It's to meet the market. The, uh, at some point early on, it was determined that the American consumer pre preferred a lighter, or brighter, more crispy product than what uh, the Europeans did. And uh, for uh, the most part, that still holds true today, although you know, it's not universal because we have the micro uh, movement that has come up to fill the gap for the people that like a, like a hardier, uh, heavier product. The rice downfall. <laughs> <laughs> Where did they the rice from? Was it shipped in? What was that, Sean? The, the rice, did it get shipped in by boat or what was the supply? It would come in by rail. From? From um, uh, Midwest, uh, excuse me, uh, Southeast oh, okay. and uh, California. Yeah. So back in the day, did most of the product go out in barrels or glass, and where did it go? Yeah, uh, it, early on, uh, it was mostly uh, kegs, wooden kegs. Then, uh, uh, as time progressed, they started putting in, in bottles, and and then uh, uh, probably uh, uh, this the, the area we're talking about of, of the breweries down below. They probably sold more in kegs. And bottles, and cans had not come into uh, uh, use at that point. I, I think kegs didn't uh, come into use until about 1946. Did they make their own barrels? They uh, they they bought the inventory of barrels, but they had a cooper on a site that uh, repaired uh, the barrels, and actually there's two different types of beer barrels. Uh, there was the the, uh, the the barrel that uh, held liquid beer, and then there's a barrel that held bottles. Yeah, in 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 that era, uh, beer would be shipped out in either wooden boxes with bottles stacked in it, or in uh, big big barrels, big round barrels. Bottles would be wrapped in paper and placed in a barrel. The barrel would be topped over and shipped out. What was the source of heat for the process? They uh, actually wood, uh, uh, more than anything. They, uh, they burn a large quantity of wood. And uh, uh, it's, I, I saw a reference to the fact that uh, some uh, People in the community would bring in a, a wagon load of wood and trade it for some uh, animal feed, <laughs> some malted barley. Now, Dan O'Neill may have some more information on that later uh, next month. I'm not sure, but uh, they, they did burn uh, an awful lot of wood. They would buy it, or you could trade it for something else. Where was the uh, barley malt operation at? The malting operations are in, uh, we had some in California, and Vancouver, Washington, and um, mainly Milwaukee in the east. Oh, so they sprouted them and roasted them there and then shipped them around? Yes. Yes. What did uh, Leopold do um, after the prohibition and shut down? Wait, I'm sorry, what, what, what did Leopold do? Oh, okay, Leopold unfortunately passed away in 1914 before prohibition came about. And that's why Adolf picked up the, uh, the load, uh, the responsibility of the brewery in uh, 1933 when Prohibition was repealed because uh, Leopold had passed away. <laughs>